So thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Joe Helbley. I'm the Dean of the Thayer School of Engineering. And I'm pleased to have you join us today, as well as many of our alumni and friends who are live streaming in for this afternoon's discussion. Today, we celebrate the upcoming presentation of the Bernard M. Gordon Prize for Innovation in Engineering and Technology Education being given to Dartmouth Thayer School of Engineering, a prize that may well be the largest and most significant award for education in the country. In celebrating this, we'd like to do something a little bit different today with our weekly seminar. Instead of a research presentation, we're going to have a conversation. A conversation with Thayer School of Engineering colleagues, in part on experiential learning, but more broadly on ways to foster creativity in engineering education, on innovations in engineering education. Our participants in this panel discussion this afternoon are four distinguished educators from the Thayer School of Engineering faculty. Introducing them from my immediate left, Professor John Collier, the holder of the Myron Tribus Professorship in Innovation, one of our Gordon Prize recipients, and the person perhaps most closely associated with what has become, at Dartmouth, an iconic course in engineering and engineering design taken by majors and non-majors alike and known to all here at Dartmouth simply as Engines 21. John has been a member of the Dartmouth Engineering faculty since 1979, and he is the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, New Hampshire Professor of the Year for the year 2010. At John's immediate left is Assistant Professor Solomon Diamond, a mechanical engineer with research interests in neuroimaging and teacher of courses in computer-aided design neuroengineering, and solid mechanics. Saul is a consummate tinkerer, someone whose courses and projects are never the same year to year. Saul has been a member of the Dartmouth Engineering faculty since 2007. At Saul's left is Professor Vicki May, an associate professor of engineering, developer of project-based courses in architecture and structural engineering, co-PI of a major NSF grant that pairs STEM graduate students, engineering and science graduate students, with middle school teachers, and the creator of Design It, Build It, a summer engineering design and project-based experience for high school students. Vicki was the recipient of both the Thayer School of Engineering and the Dartmouth College Outstanding Teacher of the Year Awards in the same year in 2012. This is the only time that that has ever happened. And Vicki is the current Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, New Hampshire Professor of the Year. Vicki has been teaching at Thayer School since 2006. And finally, at my far left is Professor Tillman Gerngross, a professor of engineering, serial biotechnology entrepreneur who has founded or co-founded five companies, four of them in the past seven years alone, and including two Upper Valley success story stories, Glycophy and Atomab. Tillman is presently the Associate Provost of Entrepreneurship and Technology Transfer at Dartmouth, and he's been a member of the Thayer faculty since 1998. So our format for today's discussion... <laughs> Thank you. Our format for today's discussion is that I will start things by asking a question of each panelist to give them a chance to talk about their philosophy and approach and some of the more creative aspects of their educational work in one specific instance each. I'll then moderate a discussion among them with a range of questions we'd like to discuss about education and the state of engineering education. And then for the last portion of our hour, I'll open it to general question and conversation with the audience. Now, as we stand here today in 2014, many observers today and frankly over the past decade have been commenting that they feel that engineering education is at a crossroads. The National Research Council has released reports calling for dramatic change in engineering education with incorporation of more project-based learning or more broadly experiential learning that goes well beyond. The explosive growth of organizations like Engineers Without Borders or here at Dartmouth our humanitarian engineering group make it clear that students themselves are seeking to enhance their education through real projects that affect real communities in the real world. Some have also suggested that perhaps part of the reason the gender disparity remains so large in engineering nationally 
is that many programs have been slow or perhaps even unwilling to experiment to bring challenging projects to students and use them as a basis for part of their education. At the same time, in a world where massively open online courses or MOOCs have gone from a curiosity to what some are hailing as the means to reduce the cost of higher education in just a few years, there's a drive to use technology to make education of higher quality, less costly, or both. Each of our panelists has addressed some of these challenges in very different ways, creatively in the classroom and in project work. And so I'd like to start the discussion by asking each of them a question to describe something that they've done that engages their students and encourages creativity. So John, since you're seated closest to me, I'm going to start with you. So John, as I said at the outset, you're the faculty member perhaps most closely associated with the introductory required projects-based course that's taken by all majors in their first or second years, and also by a very large number of non-majors. Could you take a few minutes to describe Engines 21, both the course and your approach, which you've characterized, at least in our conversations, as something of a guided apprenticeship? Sure. Uh, I uh, contrast a guided apprenticeship with uh, straightforward experiential learning. And, and experiential learning is when you climb the tree and the branch breaks and you land on your head on the ground, you've learned something. That was experiential learning. Um, if it were guided, a parent might come out and uh, sit with you and talk to you about what just went on and is that branch dead or alive? Is the branch small in diameter or large in diameter? Were you in a willow tree or an oak tree? Uh, and how far out on that branch were you? And what kind of stress were you applying? And so that would be a guided uh, apprenticeship. So in Engines 21, what we try to do is encourage the students to pick open-ended projects, something that would be of interest both to them and some clients, some users, and then attack it. But you guide them the whole way. And, and it's a, a very labor-intensive business. I don't do it single-handedly. I typically have a class of 60 to 80, and we'll have somewhere between 15 and 18 TAs. Uh, one TA per group to guide them. We have four folks in the shop who are trained to take care of these uh, students and, and guide them. And then we have some uh, electrical engineering folks and, and computer folks. So there's a, a network of folks that make a net under the students to help guide them. If I take an example of a group that did a project this winter, the project area, general area we had was solving, uh, improving the quality of life in winter. And one group decided when they went out and started meeting with people in the community, and that's one of the key characteristics, get them out of the classroom, get them out into the community. They talked to people in the community, and, and folks had solar panels, but were frustrated to get snow on it that was difficult to get off. They were thinking of different uh, ways of dealing with it and worried about uh, falling off the roof and injuring themselves. So the students sat down, started brainstorming this, thought about brushes and warm water and co coatings on the uh, panels or people, pieces that they could cover the panels with when it snowed. Um, they finally sat down and, and realized what they really needed to know is what the customer wanted. So they went back out, talked to the customer, asked them what their specifications were. And it turned out the customer is very interested in aesthetics, what this thing looks like. They don't want to have to use power off the line. They want it simple and straightforward. Short story uh, out of a long story, the students came up with a bunch of techniques which they applied, and they failed. They tried warm water, and it didn't work. They tried brushes, and they didn't work. And uh, one of the things I learned uh, as I started uh, not only teaching this course, but in the early days when I took it, uh, you have to fail. And, and uh, what Fred Hooven, my mentor, used to say is fail early and often. And uh, because you learn from every failure. You don't learn if you're not failing, and you're not learning if you're not guided in trying to understand those failures. So anyway, the students eventually came up with a, uh, a solution that was to heat the panel. But they tried heating it from the front side, and the downside of that was that they had to use the panel itself as the heating element. The users said, does that work? Yeah, it works beautifully, but it may lower the life of the panel. They didn't like that. Came up with a way of heating it from behind easily retrofit. People really liked it, but then they had to do the immersion process, which is, does it work? And so they go out and put snow on the panel and set it up and sit there at night waiting for the panel to heat up and the snow to fall off. 
And eventually it does, and they're all excited about that. But it's, it's an immersion process and a guided effort and not straight experiential learning. So John, if I can, before I move on to uh, the next question, could I just ask you to just uh, comment on the process a little bit? Because when I arrived, one of the things that fascinated me the first time I sat in on some of the project presentations is what you and the other instructors who teach this course are able to do in just 10 weeks where you take a group of students, freshmen or sophomores, who have oftentimes done very little like this at this creative, and they go from knowing nothing to identifying a problem, brainstorming possible solutions, all the way up to building, designing, testing, doing an economic and patent analysis. So just mm -hmm. tell uh, our audience a little bit about the structure and the process. Uh, structure starts where you divide the students into group, typically group of four or five. The students then go out and uh, work in the community to find out a project that will fit into their general area. Again, uh, it might be something like recreation. They talk to people who have problems in recreation or in um, uh, trying to help the elderly or help the handicapped and uh, come up with something that, that appeals to them. One group looked at a, a handicapped girl who uh, really wanted to be able to play music, but she couldn't communicate that. She had a head stick and couldn't hardly uh, communicate what her problem was. And when the students asked, she said she wanted to play chords, and they didn't really know what that meant. Well, it turned out she had one of these little Linus-type pianos, and she couldn't bring both hands in to run it. So it's learning that the first part of it then is learning about what the problem is and how you get to deal with the person or people with the problems. Then you get their specifications. What do they need for a satisfactory solution? Then they come back in and they present to a board. So we have a review board of, of five or six folks. Here's what uh, we think the problem is. Here's the background. Here's the state of the art. Here's what's been done. Uh, in the patent world on this issue, and here's what we propose to do. And they get feedback from the board for an oral presentation. They do a written piece. You feed that back. And then they go and begin to work on this in their team, typically in, in Couch Lab. Uh, how do we go about uh, tackling this problem? And most of them end up wanting to build and needing to build something. And for that, uh, we actually train them. Uh, week after week with sessions in the, uh, in the Thayer School machine shop uh, with other sessions in, uh, in the electronics lab. And so one of the things that we've been careful to do is make sure that 100% of the kids that come through 21 learn how to run equipment. They've all been trained individually in the machine shop, all been trained how to do use um, computers, how to use uh, computer-aided design software, how to run the mechanical equipment. So they're all set up so that they can build these things. Begin building really rough prototypes. They go out and test the prototypes, show them to the users, uh, get feedback again. Some of the fun ones are groups that do things like sleds, where you've designed a sled that you think is better than what's out there and more controllable. You get the faculty to loan you their kids, and they go out and try this <laughs> out. You get some very interesting feedback, uh, especially when you lose kids because they bounce off and such. So, uh, you know, but, th but that's all, you know, how do you fail early and often so you can learn how to do it better? So, so the punchline then is they come in, do a second presentation, here's our progress, they do a third progress presentation, and in the end they do a, a final presentation. And one of the keys is at that time that you look at this device that you've built and the feedback you got from your customer and you put together a business plan. How many people might be interested in buying one of these? What does it cost to produce? And can you actually make a business where you could do this? Thanks, John. And what's great about it, too, is it takes students in many ways back to the roots of engineering. Everyone, despite their experience coming in, is actually designing and building, machining right. something before they finish the course. So, Vicki, you're teaching a range of courses right now, but one of the ones I, I find fascinating is your effort in structural analysis, structural and design, and where you take a, a slightly different approach in which the entire class designs and builds one or two structures, and they're doing them for a specific customer, for a local school, a community center, a nonprofit, or a recreation area. Tell us a little bit about your approach, your reasons for taking it, and some of the challenges you find in organizing and running a class this way. Okay, so it's the class I'm teaching this term. Um, I started doing projects because I, structural analysis, students can get the analysis. I mean, it may take a little while, but they'll figure out how to do the analysis. Um, but they don't really know how to apply it to the real world. So they can do textbook problems, but they always have questions like a pin connection versus a fixed connection, and how do I model it, and how do I make those decisions? Um, so I wanted to get, get them out and do something real as opposed to textbook problems. I started by having them just design something, 
Um, and that takes it one step further, but I decided they really just need to build something. They need to be immersed in this and figure out how to do it um, on their own. It's generated so many questions and so much, they were so invested in the projects. Um, so the projects have been different every year. The tree house is probably what made me the most famous. Um, and I'll never do a tree house again, but we have one tree house. Um, sorry, Joe, if you wanted more tree, no. Um, so it, another, another approach that, uh, that I like is um, we do a lot of competitive and a lot of their problem sets are individual. So I try to get them a, a structure um, and do a cooperative do something cooperative and I use a, I'm big on the cooperative learning model um, it's from Minnesota where I'm from so I have to promote that um, but so it, everyone has to contribute to the one project that is going to get built one or two if I get a bigger class I need a couple projects to make that work um, grading too part of the reason I do that is I hated group projects as a student because I was always that anal student that did it whether anyone helped me or not because I you know I was going to do a good job um, so the cooperative learning model uh, forces me to think about individual accountability as well as group accountability. Um, and I have a personal rule that no more than 50% can be a group, group grade um, so that we can make sure everyone's working and doing their contribution. Um, I really push them to try to be creative, especially in the first phase. So they presented their first phase for my current class a couple weeks ago. Um, one of the more memorable was an under, underground jacuzzi, waterless. Okay, we're not building that. But they, they definitely pushed the envelope and had some neat ideas that we're taking forward. Um, we're building structures for the family place just down the road. Um, I like them to get in and, and talk to the community members, so we made a trip out to the family place. Um, every project we've done, we've spent a fair amount of time with the clients, um, so they hear from the clients. And they've gotten mixed messages this term on one of the, client, one of the people at the family place wants one thing and one wants another, and they have to reconcile that. Um, but I think that's good for them. Um, Let's see what other issues. Who were some of your other clients besides uh, the, the family Haven. place? So we built some play structures for the Haven last year. Um, we Which built is? The, the Haven is a nonprofit group in Norwich, not Norwich, White River Junction um, that works with homeless, the homeless. Um, they have a lot of children that come play at their uh, play and stay at the, at the Haven. So they wanted some play structures out back for their smallest children. Um, I've had students, so we went, we did a, a nursery school early on. It was one of my first projects. My class was small, and I said, we're going to build something. Um, and one of, the, one of the students, a woman, came to my office and said, we really have to build it. The kids are counting us. And she was almost in tears. She said, are you sure we can get it done in 10 weeks? And, and I wasn't. But I said, yes, I'm sure we can. <laughs> um, but the students take a lot of ownership for it, and it's amazing what they can get done in 10 weeks because they're invested in it. And the questions they come back with, you know, for the treehouse, we got a truck stuck in the mud, then we got a tractor stuck in the mud, so we ended up carrying everything up, and then they're like, how are we going to get things in the tree? And I, I don't know. How are we going to get things in the tree? We got something in the tree, and it didn't fit. Your son was one of them. Well, we're going to have to make it fit. We've got to figure it out. So it's, it's problem solving. It's looking at the connection, and they'll ask, how do I model this? And I'm like, well, try it a couple ways and see what, what fits best. So. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So Saul, as I, I said in my introductory remarks, you've already, in your brief time here, gotten a reputation as the consummate tinkerer. Tell us a little bit about the twist cars and the die wheel, what they are, how it works, why you think it engages the students, and why you change it so radically every year. So this is uh, part of a class that I'm teaching right now. It's um, uh, computer-aided uh, mechanical engineering design. That's for what level students, Saul? So this is generally for uh, seniors and our fifth-year engineering students, usually a good mix of those two groups. Uh, once in a while, a, a brave uh, third-year student comes in. And, it's, uh, and it builds on other courses we teach here. So we have faculty usually, take it every once in a while. Faculty even take it once in a while. <laughs> so it builds on solid mechanics. It builds on machine design. And so by the time I get them in this, uh, this uh, mechanical engineering design with CAD, they're ready to be challenged. These are students who are looking, uh, often looking towards uh, careers in mechanical engineering and design. And I take the opportunity to, to move them outside of what they have seen in their, in their daily lives, what they have thought about. I want to give them design challenges that will uh, sort of put them in, a, in an alternative reality where they're able to unlock some creativity and really go a different direction. So I also happen to think that sometimes it's OK to have a lot of fun in an engineering class. So I was looking around for project ideas and was in a toy store at the time. And I was riding around and I'm in a toy store. I got to try out the fun thing. So there was this plasma car. You sit on it and you kind of wiggle the steering wheel and it moves you forward. And I thought, gee, that would be fun to make with uh, engineering students. We could make 
big ones. We could make them fast. We could have races. So I brought this idea to the students and they, they, they got on board with it. So we had uh, twist cars and we did this race a couple of times and each time, each year I run that, they would get faster and better and I started to see ideas that I had um, never dreamed of getting integrated into these things uh, that were making them smooth, fast, and uh, really fun to ride. So if, if I can interrupt, maybe this is urban legend, but what I've heard is not only did you bring the idea to the class, but you walked in with a stack of patents, slapped them down on the table, and said, here's the state of the art that covers this. Your job is to innovate beyond. I, I did do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so I, Thank you. So that's verified, and I will note that in your file at the end of the afternoon. So I wanted students to know that when you're, when you're working in design, you're not working in a vacuum. There, almost any problem that I've dreamt of where I think, I wake up, you know, that is just something no one else in the world could have possibly dreamt of that. And you, you, so you go to the literature, you look in the patents, you look and see what's out there, and sure enough, someone has worked on that problem before. And I wanted students to find that out. And so I, I gave them several, I gave them about 10 patents for the twist cars to look at. And uh, of course, the plasma car included, but other ones as well. Some that had made it commercially, others that did not. And they had to come up with designs that were significantly improved beyond anything that was out there. I needed to see innovation in their design work that was um, that was not just new, but actually served a function. Made these things you know, faster, better, more comfortable, more maneuverable. They needed to show up in the performance. Um, we did that for a few years. I thought, now students are, have learned too much from prior years. It's time to mix it up. And so I looked around for other crazy vehicles, found some interesting websites talking about uh, vehicles with not enough wheels, and, and came up with the idea that we should build die wheels. So this is when you have two giant hoops and a frame that you've built that rolls inside of the hoops. And these are pedal power. And it's more like tank steering. So either you've got levers or you've got some kind of cranks or some way or another you've got to figure out how to propel and steer your frame inside these giant hoop wheels. And we race them outside on the lawn outside there. Um, so we did it last year. We had um, moderate success. Some worked very well. Others had, uh, other students had very innovative ideas but, but were challenged by execution. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> what exactly do you mean by that? <laughs> It's to go from concept to race in about four weeks, where you're building a, a, a machine that is as big as you are and it's going to carry your body and three other people on your team in a relay race, that, that is hard to do. And you have got to be, you've got to be completely on the ball, organized, uh, creative and decisive right. together and execute it well using all the facilities that we have here at Thayer. Lots of support from the staff, of course, lots of support from, from um, other students who are pull, pulling together, lots of TA support, and we, and we get it done. And that's, that's part of it is that you throw students into these challenges that are um, terrifying at the outset. And then on race day, it can be a, a, a brilliantly wonderful time just to see that, see that energy come out and to see the creativity manifest in the physical world. And that, that's the kind of experience I think students need in design to unlock that kind of energy and be able to then take it and channel it in other directions as they, you know, as they want to in their careers. Right. Thank you, Sal. So. so Tillman, you're famous locally, not just for being a successful biotechnology entrepreneur and for asking provocative questions, but for teaching courses in which all students are examined individually, adaptively through oral exams tailored to the particular student's level of knowledge. Now, at a liberal arts institution like Dartmouth, that's certainly not an unfamiliar approach, but in a quantitative engineering course, it's essentially unheard of. So how does it work? Why did you go down that path, and what are you hoping to accomplish by doing it that way? So there, there are two benefits that I've observed by going down that path. And um, the first one really relates to the students, that um, Higher education, in a way, is no different than in other areas of human activity where the outcome that we measure, the metrics we measure, and how we measure them has a big influence of how the system ultimately works and what output it produces. And uh, 
the course in particular where I use this, uh, this approach, uh, Introduction to Biotechnology, is a course that is very rich in concepts. Um, so it's, it's perhaps less quantitative than some of our un other engineering courses, but there are a lot of different concepts. And what our students typically um, have optimized around is uh, an exchange of question and answer in a written format where it's very easy to give the appearance of knowing what the concept is while actually not understanding what, what, what's going on. And I found that frustrating because it ends up uh, um, um, resulting in discussions after the exam. Well, if you read it this way, that's what I actually meant. And, and, and those types of discussions are, um, are not only uh, um, unsatisfactory, but um, it's just an ongoing negotiation that, that I didn't want to be part of. So I felt um, two things. One is that if you actually have the students sitting in your office and you have a verbal exchange and you ask a question, you, dis you, you tell them exactly what the standards are in terms of what it means to answer the question uh, correctly. Um, it, the second you see them veering off in the wrong direction, you follow up and you so the, the amount of information you can exchange over a 20 minute period, in my opinion, is like a two hour exam or even more. And so it's very direct. Um, and very effective in, in that regard in terms of assessing knowledge. Uh, the other thing that I feel we overemphasize is assessing uh, knowledge through, uh, through uh, written exams or papers. And when you look at actually what happens to our students once they leave this place is yes, the first interactions you send in your resume. The second interaction, provided you are applying for the types of jobs we want our students to apply to, is you meet an intelligent, knowledgeable person that you hopefully are intimidated by because you, you're, you're aiming high and you have to demonstrate to that person that you know something. And, and so um, at the beginning of the term, when I explain to them that there will be two oral exams, most, most of the students have not had oral exams before, it scares the living bejesus out of them. But once they have it and you actually look at the teaching assessments after, at the end of the term, the vast majority of them sort of say that's one of the best experiences that they've had, sitting in the office with the professor and being challenged um, um, through this verbal exchange. They find it very rewarding. And so as I tried it and noticed that the feedback was very positive, I kept on doing it. And the other sort of side effect or second element that I felt was very helpful is when I ask a particular question to five students over the course of these exams take a long time. It takes two days to sort of work through the whole class. But when I see consistent weakness in certain areas, I quickly realize that's my problem. Because if, if, if they all sort of don't understand particular aspects or particular concepts, I must have done a pretty poor job in explaining them. So it's, again, a very direct feedback loop to the educator or to the lecturer of you've got to spend more time on this, so you have to explain it in a different way to, to get that particular concept across. So. So I found both of these to be meaningful benefits that, uh, that uh, I've seen both for the students and, and for the way you refine your approach to teaching. Do you find that it works better with students at a certain level? You know, juniors better than BE students or master students, or do you think it, it works equally well across the board? I think it works equally well across the board. Where I see the biggest gap is that the students that really understand the material, they love it because they're sitting there, you're asking them questions, and they're like, yeah, it's a I chance to show reason, off. Right. right? Here's my professor, and I can, I can shine with my knowledge. The students that are used to um, sort of just about scrape by, for them, it's painful. It's like showing up at the dentist and you didn't floss and you didn't brush your teeth, and it just goes, <laughs> goes south from there quickly. And so the gap is much bigger um, um, between the star students and the ones that um, took the class right. probably for the wrong reasons. So. Right. Thank you. So, so thank you all. So what I'd like to do now for the next 15 minutes or so is I've got a series of questions I'm going to throw out. I'll ask perhaps one or two of you, maybe two to answer each. I might one of them go to all four of you, but I'd rather keep it moving around. Um, so this is like an adaptive oral exam. We'll push you just far enough. <laughs> See, so let me, let me start by asking a question of interdisciplinarity. So what does interdisciplinary in the context of engineering mean to you personally? And do you consider your teaching to be interdisciplinary? Why or why not? So Saul, I'm going to pick on you first. What do you think? Interdisciplinary is, is absolutely central to what I do uh, in my research life and in my teaching. So uh, although I teach these courses in mechanical engineering, I also 
teach a class in neuroengineering. And you normally don't hear neuroengineering and mechanical engineering in this, you know, together, but that's the, those are the two worlds that I live in every day. So does it mean then bringing non-engineering concepts and engineering concepts, and, and is that what you mean by interdisciplinary in yes. your context? Yes, so it's, it's two, two core areas of, of traditional learning, and there are synergies and there are, um, yeah, there are insights that come from living in two different worlds. Um, and I think that's it's a really important part of what we do here at Dartmouth in terms of liberal arts, in terms of uh, blending liberal arts and engineering together, and you know, so having uh, you know, having faculty who are also engaged in very different ways of interacting with with uh, traditional disciplines brings brings that right to the front, and uh, so I will end up sometimes bringing examples into a mechanics class that might seem a little odd to the students at first, but it's comfort zone for me, and uh, so that also opens up the door for students to think, oh well, maybe this other area that I've been learning about somewhere else on campus is relevant in some way, in some unexpected way, and that can lead to uh, new insights, new discoveries, and it's a, it's a different kind of process from traditional problem solving. It's, a, it's an emergent property of interdisciplinary study and learning. I, I also understand, maybe I shouldn't ask this publicly, but there's a, another one of these stories that you once used dance to demonstrate. <laughs> All right, so it is true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> right, now you have to comment on sure, it. Sure, sure. So th this is part of, um, sometimes you're giving a traditional lecture and you, you feel like maybe people are falling asleep. And so if you were to get up on the table and do the moonwalk, it might wake people up. <laughs> so I did that. <laughs> All right, I, I'm not going to push on that any further. I think let's move on. So Vicki, what about you? What does interdisciplinary mean he to you me, and for you? He made me stand on a can once in class. We co-taught yeah. a class, so yeah, I've seen it all. Um, interdisciplinary in my class. Um, my, I, I co-teach a class with an architect. I've co-taught a class with Professor Diamond as well. Um, so that was definitely interdisciplinary, and we, we definitely tried to keep it not one person teach half the class and then the architect teach half the class. So we try to bring them in and meld them and show that we need to have integration between engineering and architecture. Um, but in all my classes, just having the mindset that this is, yes, we're uh, talking about structural design, but there's lots of things that feed into that. We need to understand materials. Um, we need to understand what, they, what the client wants. So there's psychology going on there. Um, and just all those important factors that come in. Um, one of my groups this term is working on a snowflake project for the hook set, the welcome center. Um, it's a small group and it's kind of a special project, but you know, there's actually not all that much structural in it. And they were talking today, but do we have to understand the, the glass property? So I'm like, well, the project's not going to work if you don't. So, um, so getting out there and looking at different things. So let me ask uh, you each uh, to think about a question. So the National Academy of Engineering several years ago identified 14 grand challenges, big problems that we expect to be facing society for a century in areas like health care, energy, sustainability, communications, security, that um, should, they argued, be problems that the engineering community, the folks that we're educating today, are coming up prepared to tackle. And so how uh, do you think more needs to be done to make engineering education relevant to these grand challenges, to the big problems that our students are going to be facing when they graduate? So Tillman, what do you think? I mean, one of the things that Vicky said really, really resonated with me, and that is that we have very, very intelligent students here. And so when you look at sort of your traditional textbook, in theory, you could say at the beginning of the term, here's the textbook, work through the various chapters, I'll see it at the end of the term, and they will master the material to a point where they can solve all the problems in the problem sets. But that's not a very satisfactory experience for them or for us, for that matter. So I think at the end of the day, we're contextualizers. Our job is to take that knowledge that is in those textbooks and make them relevant to what's going on right now. And, so, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Exa really exactly that. Big problems in healthcare, drug Oh, the grand, grand, grand challenges. Grand challenges. So, sorry, sorry, yep. Um, so, and part of that is explaining to our students um, uh, what those grand challenges are. And of course, they have to pertain to the particular subject in, in some way, right. and, and why there are such 
big challenges. And, uh, and, and I think it's, a, it's, again, a very powerful tool of connecting the world they live in to a textbook which, which inherently gives relevance and, and, and people want to do things that are relevant. So. I mean, it strikes me that the project-based approach that you've all described in different ways is, is immediately germane, relevant, and appropriate for trying to do this. You can pick a problem in a broad area. John, you described this in Engines 21 so well, where you're giving students, okay, if, well, I forgot what you said about this winter's theme, projects and processes to improve the quality of life in winter. That's not just, well, that's a grand challenge in Hanover, New Hampshire. It may not be nationally, but that's the idea, connecting them to outward-facing problems that are significant and going to, to impact their careers. So let me ask, uh, so John, let me ask you a, a question. Tillman and Vicky both uh, touched on this a bit, talking about the creativity of the students, and I'm struck that many of us say students today are different in some ways than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Is that, so you're nodding your head, yes. What, should I move on to the next question, or would you like to elaborate? No, it, it, it sort of smacks you in the face, which is so interesting. It, it, and so what happened uh, with me is I, in a, about the year 2004, 5, 6, I, I came to the realization that as much as I enjoyed teaching 21 and having the kids work on projects, that there were two things that were going on. One was that uh, within a group, you would have the people who did and the people who watched. And within the, 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 the group, whoever did, whoever fabricated and didn't do the, the written report or didn't do the patent search or the literature search, but actually built the thing, uh, whoever was doing that uh, had a set of tools that was different from what the other kids had and, and not very good tools, and, and that this was different. So, so for the first bunch of years that I taught the course, most of the students who would come in were by nature tinkerers, tinkerers who said, gee, I, I've been building go-karts or tree houses or whatever, and I'm not very good at it, and I want to get better, so I'm going to be an engineer so I can make a faster go-kart or a better plane or whatever it is that they're interested in. And that they came in with skills. I mean, they had thumbs that were beat up from hitting them with hammers. And so, so you had, you were sort of preaching to the choir, as they say. And, and uh, more recently then, as of past the year 2000, the students who came in mostly seemed less into that kind of thing. So I finally, we had clickers that year, the first year of clickers, where you could anonymously answer a question, because questions that I was going to ask were a little intimidating. So I passed out the clickers, and I said, how many of you have ever drilled a hole of any kind <laughs> in anything? And if you had done this in, in 1990, you know, people would have been throwing stuff at you and laughing at you. And, and about 50% of the students had ever drilled a hole in anything. Well, I mean, it seems a little unusual here. Unfortunately, I ended up in a meeting up campus with other faculty, and I, I ended up in one of those moments where I'm talking to the person next to me, and I said to, to Saul, I said, uh, do you know I asked my class, and only half of them had ever drilled a hole. Well, of course, the room was quiet at that instant, and, and everybody <laughs> looks at me, and the person leading this meeting looks over at me, and she says, and why would you want to drill a hole? <laughs> so, so anyway, th things have changed. And, and, and so there we are with, with half the students don't, don't know why you drill a hole and certainly had never tried. And when you go to the next level, if you ever run a lathe or a milling machine or a welder or, you know, no. Um, and so, so I sat down with Kevin Barron, and, and we, who runs our, our machine shop, and, and said, we, we've really got to change this. We've got to do something really quite different than we've ever done before. And, and the way 21 had always been worked is it was open. So you had to come to class, and then the rest of the time was work on your project. And there was never a lab. And, and uh, so in 2007, we set up a lab. And you had to come for two hours a week, and we were going to teach Every student, not only to drill holes, but to how to run milling machines and lathes and bandsaws and you name it. And so if you had a group of five, you had a TA for each group, and the TAs then got trained by Kevin so they could help out. And Kevin has three other uh, professionals in there as instructors 
And so we took it on ourselves. We're going to take 60 to 80 kids, and we're going to teach them one at a time how to run all the equipment. And, and they did. And, of course, when the course reviews come, I'm panicked because everybody's going to be upset because they blew two hours a week. And it, and it turned out they loved it. And so ever since, we've been doing that and trying to get better. So everyone who takes 21 learns computer-aided design at one level or another. They all run all the equipment. And what we've done then is try to generate a, a mechanism to do that where the women are as well-treated and interested and encouraged and, and supported as the guys were back before um, we ever had women interested in engineering. And, and so I think they found this to be a comfortable, supportive setting, and I think it's helped us to bring women into engineering and to get everybody, when they hit Saul's course, Nobody's surprised that they're going to have to do more solid works. Nobody's surprised they got to build stuff in the machine shop. And some of the students we send you are actually quite skilled before they get to you. Yeah, I think that's you know that's the the gender gap issue, and that's one of the last questions I want to come back to in a, in a minute and ask a few of you. But I've been struck by that that it's a wonderful way of leveling the playing field, and so a certain group of students might perceive that everyone else has more experience in this area. And as soon as you're talking about something hands-on, it could be a barrier, but by having every student go through it, you immediately eliminate those concerns. And I think that's, you know, the fact that our engineering enrollments at the undergraduate and graduate level run from 30 to 35 percent every year, which is twice national average. I think things like this are a huge contributor. So I'm just going to ask two more questions before we open it up broadly and we'll be fairly focused here. Tillman, I wanted to ask you this question. So the Thayer School today is receiving an award for an approach to teaching engineering entrepreneurship that extends from the moment students set foot on campus all the way through to the PhD. I wanted to ask you, what does entrepreneurship mean to you in the context of your work? What elements do you see in your own particular teaching, project advising, research that help foster the skills, appreciation, understanding, enthusiasm, desire to our students to take their work and have an impact that goes well beyond just handing in a project at the end of the term. Yeah, I mean, I think it weaves together several of the themes that we've already talked about. One is the big challenges. I mean, what are the problems we, um, we would like to um, work on and ultimately solve? And um, I think the, the, the academic profession is very much um, tied to uh, ways or ways of assessing metrics of success or impact that are very much driven by how many publications, how many people cite my work, and all that gets tallied up, and that means you are a uh, better faculty member than if you have fewer citations. So we have our own system by which we try to assess the impact of our scholarly work. And most students don't care about that, quite frankly. Um, what they do care about, though, is they, they do want to change the world and make it a better place, and they want to have impact. And so I think that's where this, these themes sort of come together, that as you identify meaningful problems that, that they would like to solve and, and sort of chart a path by which they can, in fact, contribute to that or do it themselves, it, 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 it typically generates a lot of excitement and interest. And so. It's, it's, a, it's a broader dialogue that um, I think we're trying to uh, broaden beyond just engineering school that the way we at Dartmouth should or are starting to think about impact has to go beyond traditional methods of assessment. But, um, and I think Terry actually um, floated this concept of lives touched or some other metric that goes beyond what we, what we typically do. And, and I think we're making really good progress in at least having that conversation, and you can absolutely see it amongst the students. It really resonates with them, and you see it in the PhD innovation program and other other activities that we are we are promoting. But um, so I, so I believe it's tying together the grand ideas, solving those uh, sorry the grand uh, problems, and, and and working and solving some of them that uh, gets our students excited and um, seeing that that. In this place here, we, we, uh, we value that and we celebrate it when, when there are successes. I think it's sort of gradually but steadily changing the culture. Mm. Do you think it can be taught? And, and I ask this and, and answer this mindful of the fact that we're about to receive an award for doing just that. But do you think, <laughs> do you think entrepreneurship well, or the skills? Signed, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, there's been an argument that's existed for many years. You know, some prominent venture capitalists, no one on our board, but have said, I recognize an entrepreneur when I see one, you're born with it. And I, I, don't, I don't buy that, but uh, I'd like your thoughts. I think um, our actions and our thoughts are informed by, own, by our own experiences. And I think there's a, a large role that we as faculty play as role models um, and uh, showing students that you can do something that has real impact, I think inspires them and they, um, uh, they will try things that they otherwise may not have tried. And so I think, as, 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 as John is saying, the more things you try and then perhaps fail, the more you learn, but ultimately I, I do think you can, you, can move, you can move the meter by encouraging more of our, um, I remember when I came here, 1998 and, and was talking to the people in, in, uh, in career services and, and the metrics at the time were we landed X number of students at Microsoft. We landed X number of students at Ford Motor Company. And I thought, ah, that's interesting. When I last checked, Bill Gates was doing just fine. I want to find a way of finding the next Bill Gates or at least encouraging people to think at that level. Right. And, and again, you know, these things take time, but I think we are, we are making progress. So last question, and it's a, I'll toss it up as a softball to Saul and Vicky since the two newest members of our, our faculty on the panel. How can we reduce the gender gap in engineering education? I'll let you have you jump. Um, I wish I had an easy answer. If we had an easy answer, we wouldn't have a gender gap, would we? Um, I, I think it's a complex problem, but I think we're tackling it. We're at 35% as opposed to 18%. We're not alone. Uh, Mary Flanagan, I was with, in a meeting, she's a computer science and digital arts faculty member, and she's upset about the low numbers in computer science, which are worse than engineering. Her phrase was she wanted 50-50 by 2020. Um, I think we want to beat her, 50-50 in 2019? I don't know. Um, doesn't have the same ring, so I don't know if that's going to work. Um, I think we, you know, Engines 21, getting getting women in to actually learn how to do things in the machine shop, empowering them, um, having role models, um, having impact. Uh, women like to, or tend to want to have more of an impact using a collaborative as opposed to competitive atmosphere. Um, all of which things I think we're we're trying to tackle. So, I, I would just I just want to add one thing because if that's the goal. Intro to biotech, the ratio is 60-40. 60 women, 40 male. Well, I shouldn't so, say this, but I was at Cal Poly in the architectural engineering department. It was 50-50 15 years ago, so that's our target. Different departments attract women right. differently, and that's a right. pretty known fact. I so. mean, what's remarkable here is that it's 35% across the board across rather the board, than right. specific disciplines, and I think you know, my view is the interdisciplinary structure, the project-based learning, the things we do with students from the beginning to get them comfortable in the labs and have them focusing on real-world challenges are motivating to a much broader cross-section of the students. The other thing that you can do is you can bring them into the labs and hire them uh, to, to learn what you're doing and work with you in the lab. Right. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a time when we ha have had fewer than six women working in our lab, and from time to time it's many more than that. You, you bring them in and, and very quickly they get real comfortable and they see what's going on and, and uh, if you have a whole bunch and have a, a, an atmosphere that's welcoming, more folks want to come in and join you. I think that we, we need to rethink the whole way that the world thinks about engineering, honestly. <laughs> the, uh, you, you ask anyone on the street, of what, what, who goes into engineering? The majority response is going to be people who like math and physics. It's not going to be the response won't be people who want to go and fix the problems in the world, right. uh, people who want to have impact, become engineers. And most of the women I know who are engineers really don't care about whether they need to learn to drill a hole along the way or solder a circuit or program a computer, they, they've got a, a broader objective in mind about having impact on the world and these other these other tools and techniques are just you know, things you gotta do to get there. Whereas the traditional view of how we you know, how we've looked at engineering is that it is the tools and it's it's not what it's about. So I think um, that's so we, we need to rethink 
how we talk about it. Very, very well put. There's a challenge for the National Academy there to help us manage that conversation nationally and broadly. I think that's a very important point. So we have about eight minutes left. I wanted to take the time to open it up and see if there are questions from the audience. I have a whole list more that I can go through. But uh, I mean, ask, so when I call on you, I will ask you to direct a concise question to one or at most two individuals. And I will ask for please concise responses. Ross? So each of you a very quick example. So, so Dartmouth has these 10-week terms where students are taking up most usually three classes. So the intensity is ratcheted up so high. But that is, I, I believe, highly conducive to problem solving and design. Because some things just don't work well on a slow burn. Sometimes it's got to be all in, all you're thinking about day in, day out, even when you're asleep. And that's what we see in the Thayer students. And so that, that shows up. I mean, I see it in in, in courses like like 146 with the like with the die wheels, uh, and I've seen it in students I've advised in their uh, capstone design engineering 8990 projects, which John will probably comment on. So, so is there a specific the example you would cite, or uh, too many to count? I, I think the uh, uh, a good one would be like the the uh, there was a, a, a project, a humanitarian engineering project, to to redesign a water pump in Haiti. And that, that one was, was really challenging because it was also at a distance. They had to figure out problem solving with uh, all these logistical challenges as well. So I was particularly impressed that that team was able to pull it together and deal with distance, design, hydraulics, mechanics all together Great. in 10 weeks. Really impressive. Thank you, Saul. But John, a quick example? I, I think one of them, I, I mentioned this young girl who had cerebral palsy in the head stick, and I didn't really finish that story. And student group went down, and, and she beat out with her head stick on a, a board with the alphabet that she wanted to play chords. And so this group decided they're going to help her. And so while this isn't you know, one of the big national or international problems, for this girl, it turned out to be a really big problem because she wanted to play music and couldn't. And so the first thing they had to do was to figure out what the cerebral palsy had done to her. And so they set up cardboard um, uh, pieces that were at a slight slope with different size markings on them to see what she could hit with her hand as a target. And it turned out with one hand, she was actually pretty accurate and could hit a pretty small spot. And with her other hand, she was very inaccurate and had to hit a big spot. But if you put it in front of her, she couldn't do anything at all. She could only hit things out to her side. And so the group decided, we're going to make her a musical instrument. So they went back and forth and thought about all these things, decided electronic organ for, for this girl. And so they, they, they made up some uh, sort of kludgy keys that she could press to figure out exactly what she wanted them to look like and feel like. But it turns out this girl's an artist, and so she wanted things really well done. So they went down to the machine shop. Asked if they were set up to do wood, not really. Went down to the wood shop, bought some cherry, made this cherry cabinet, went to the machine shop, cut all these keys out that were just the right size, got Casio to donate an electronic organ. This is all in 10 weeks. Hooked up this organ in internal to this with all the keys. And the day before final presentations, they went down to Prouty Center where this girl was a patient and put her in front of this organ, this beautiful cherry cabinet organ. And uh, she got in there, looked around, figured things out, and started playing green sleeves. <laughs> and so these kids are just completely blown away. And so they do their presentation in front of our audience in the review board. And they show a videotape of this. And nobody can say a word. And they're waiting for the applause. And everybody's like, like this. You know? <laughs> so it's like 15 seconds later, finally people applaud. But that has had such an impact on those kids that they followed up with this, this girl. And it turns out she is very bright. She has 140 IQ. 
and has gotten into writing music and playing it with this organ, and, and it's on YouTube. And, and so it's like, wow. So thank you, thank you, John. So one or two other quick questions. Bill, you had your hand up. I've been lucky enough to have some pretty good interactions with people in all kinds of different areas, teaching them problem solving, how to set the specifications up so that you really understand what has to be fulfilled for a solution to work, teaching brainstorming techniques, um, how do you actually come up with lots of ideas, and, and then weighing techniques, how do you weigh these ideas against your specs, and then what do you do afterwards? And so it works just as well for buying cars, picking majors, uh, deciding what foreign study trip to go on, uh, et cetera. So, it's, so the open-ended problem solving is really neat because it does work with any department, any division, any kind of problem. And it's something that students take out of 21 and use for the rest of their lives. I mean, I'm, I don't know if I should say it, but I'm, I'm so thankful for, for this uh, sort of whole experience that we're having over the last few weeks because one of the things I found in my email is tons of letters from students who say here's how I use those techniques. I'm in business or I'm in uh, education or I'm in the arts, but I'm using your techniques to do things. So great job. I think it Thank works you. So is there one final very brief question? I said very brief and the two faculty who had their hands up just put them down. <laughs> All right, Lee, be brave, be bold, be brief. I'll give it a shot. I'm asking Tillman uh, and, and Saul a question. Okay. So, when I teach ES22, I tell the students, school of course, you can answer a little question fast. Life of course, you can ask a big question fast. And so, I'm curious, what is the difference between a school of course and a school of course? Because I think we do very good at times truly excellent work at the level of innovation that can lead to prototypes. You each have 20 seconds to respond, <laughs> and I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, so that's a great question, Lee. And I, I think that <laughs> students who are engaged in uh, participating in research in the labs begin to get begin to go down that road. And I, I, I see it in students who are working in my lab right now, where they're working on problems that will be lifelong pursuits potentially, and the. They're just trying to get started at this point. Understand what are the what's the nature of the challenges? What's the nature of, of the tools available now? What uh, where are the opportunities for innovation? Where are the opportunities to move forward? And setting these students up in a way that they can begin that long process is, I think, also part of our part of our mission. Tillman, you have the last word. How many seconds do you have? Eleven. <laughs> Eleven. <laughs> I think it goes back to what I said earlier. At the end of the day, we're contextualizers. And, uh, and so I think the way you describe these problems, our job is to break down big problems into little problems that within the confines of a 10-week class or a four or five year education, they can see how chipping away at these little problems can make a difference at that scale. And then they, from then, I think they can extrapolate that Guess what? The more we do that, the more you sort of start chipping away at the bigger problems. And, and uh, I, I just think we're simply constrained by the time we have them. And, uh, and many of the problems you're thinking about are not, not even decades. They could be multiple decades that uh, it will take to solve those. So. Well, thank you, Tillman. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for interesting responses and stimulating discussion.